uh, because for far too long, society has really turned a blind eye to the mental health crisis. You know, you just, if you ignore it, it'll go away, right? If you just pretend people are not out there, you just walk past them, uh, you don't have to, to deal with the realities of life. But these are our fellow citizens. You know, sometimes life deals you a curveball. You might find yourself with mental health challenges, not sure how to cope, who you turn to, homelessness, poverty, addiction, and all of a sudden you're in this spiral and you don't know how to get out. Knowing this, when I took office as governor two years ago, I said enough is enough. I said, let's rethink how we help those who are in most dire straits, those that are in these severe and unsafe conditions. And I said, and we'll start right here in the great city of New York. And I want to thank the people who have joined me here today. Uh, Dr. Ann Sullivan, you have been my partner on this journey. We have focused on mental health like no other administration in history. And I want everyone here to give uh, our commissioner of the Office of Mental Health a huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Uh, one of our clinicians is Erica Riley. You'll be hearing from Erica shortly, but I also want to make sure we give you a round of applause as well, and thank you for being on this journey to help people. Someone you're going to hear from because he has a powerful story is Alto Watts. We just had a conversation, and he represents so many faces of people who do not have the opportunity to have their lives turned around. But he's an example of what we can do when we're intentional, when we say these lives matter. We bring in professionals with huge hearts full of love, and that's how we start making a difference. And just in less than 24 hours after I gave my first day of the state address, I stood in the subway, went down to announce a new approach down to Fulton Street, and I said, let's do something different. Let's put $25 million out there for trained mental health professionals to be on our streets and subways. We call them our safe option support teams or conveniently SOS teams. The first year was so successful. But I knew it takes time to build relationships, right? You don't just go up to someone and say, oh, I'm here to save your life. Follow me. You're going to be fine. It doesn't. I mean, you're all nodding your heads. It doesn't work like that. It, and so many times people have tried this and they gave up because, well, we only have this much money. We only have this many people. And we have to go on and on and on and not make the real difference that I was looking for. The first year was so successful, I said we're going to add more money to it. We added uh, upwards of an increase to get us up to $33 million to keep the good work going. So what are these teams doing? Why are they worth the investment? Uh, just back in October, saw some of you, went down there again, and I gave everybody a big hug, as I often do, and said, thank you. Thank you. You're doing God's work here on earth, and keep it up. Because what they're bringing is deep clinical knowledge, but also this innate compassion that you seldom encounter. Uh, you truly are unique individuals. And they look for people who are lost, people who are in pain, people who may be a danger to themselves or others. You know what? They treat them with respect. They give them dignity. They listen. They follow up. They develop a rapport. And many of these people have been unhoused for years. So you build this wall around yourself. You don't want to be, have that wall come crumbling down. You don't want to expose your vulnerabilities because it hurts too much. And many just become resigned to living on the streets, wandering from here to there, maybe even giving up hope. And they distrust our institutions because they have failed them. They may have been in and out of foster care. They may have not had a stable home. There's just a lot of negativity. And they don't see one of our SOS teams say, oh, the Calvary has arrived. The SOS teams are here. Uh, let's go. But when you make that intentional effort and connect with them as people, we can really make a difference. And that's what we did. And I'm really proud to announce that New York City's 14 of these teams have connected with more than 330 formerly chronically homeless people and have connected them with 
not just mental health services, but permanent housing. That's 330 people who had been given up on, who were relegated to the streets and subways, who had no other options except for our, our SOS options. And that is the difference we're making every single day out there. And they're, right, they're getting wraparound services. It's not just, oh, we've convinced you to go into a home and good luck. You know, we're all done with you. On to the next one. No, that's not how you change lives for the long term. You can't just let, let people on their own who've had to rely on the streets and themselves for a long time. You have to build support around that. And that's, it's clear to me that our strategy is working. But these cases of homelessness and mental health challenges are not confined to the five boroughs. And that's why we're announcing that we're expanding this to other regions of the state. I'm announcing seven new state option support teams are going to be canvassing communities from Long Island all the way up to upstate New York, so Westchester, Long Island, the Hudson Valley, Capital Reason, Southern Tier, all the way over to Western New York, my hometown. And we're going to continue adding more because I'll invest money in programs that work. And you have proven to me that this works. There's 330 people who no longer have to sleep under the stars at night and hope they're not attacked or harmed. They have the dignity of the God-given right to have a roof over their heads. So we also have to make sure that the mental health system is working as well. And we have to focus on inpatient care. Now, we had a severe shortage after the pandemic. I've stood here many times and spoken about the fact that many beds that had been for psychiatric care were converted to COVID beds during the pandemic. Fine, but the pandemic's been over for a while and many institutions and hospitals did not go back to having the services available. So we ended up with a shortage at a time when more people are dealing with mental health challenges than ever before, all the way from our young kids to our seniors, challenges and they need help and the beds weren't there. So that was a break in the chain right there. And we've made entire investments in the entire continuum of care. Last year we announced $50 million, $50 million more to add inpatient psychiatric beds. We're gonna keep putting the money out there to make sure that these services are provided for. And also, I wanna make sure that we're continuing our psych hospitals, that they're continuing to bring beds back online. And if they don't do it, they say they can't do it, we're holding them accountable. Because I'm not taking no for an answer. You need to be aware that no doesn't work very well for, with me. And so far, because of our diligence and pushing forward, we have over 500 beds have come back online from our community hospitals. We're also stepping up our efforts at our state-run facilities. Um, I promised 150 beds last year would come back online. We were ahead of schedule, already ahead, and now we're going to do another 200 more, including 75 beds for those who've had repeated run-ins with the law, who need extra services, for people in crisis, who need to be on that road to recovery. But here's what happens. We convince people to come in. We finally have a bed available. They get the treatment. And then what happens after that? No one ever asked these questions before. They thought our job was done. Except if they're discharged without a meaningful plan and follow through, the odds are pretty good that this individual may fall through the cracks again. It takes time to turn around a lifetime of despair and be welcomed back into society. So that's where we lose, that's where we've always lost people. And I said, now we're gonna be requiring that there's discharge plans, right, Commissioner? We're proposing regulations. Uh, you've already released them. Today you released proposed regulations for emergency rooms. What happens, what hospitals have to do now, what they're obligated to do is to have a, a discharge plan that is followed up upon and that's so we people don't keep cycling through the system. Now, they can only be discharged after they've had adequate treatment and a plan for follow-up care. That's the difference I'm talking about here. And so for many, the next phase will be supportive housing, be these wrap wraparound services, and make sure that these people have support. And since I announced our landmark, much talked about, $1 billion investment in mental health, I'm proud to announce that of that $1 billion, We've already made 768 million of it 
available to create more housing for people with mental illness. That's just in the short time since I announced this. As you know, I'm impatient, right, Commissioner? I'm always having meetings saying, show me the numbers. What are we doing? How are we doing? And so we're making real progress here. And I'm talking about places like VIP Community Services, a certified community behavioral health clinic in the Bronx I just visited a couple months ago. Uh, those places are transforming lives. And I'll conclude with this. Uh, I'm proud of the progress we've made. There's no way I'll ever stand here and say our work is done. But now we know the path forward. We know the strategies that work. And those are the strategies that I'll keep investing in as governor, with our state legislature, with my budget, every single year that I am governor because there are too many people that are God's children who need our help and our love and a path forward. And one of the truest measures of society is how we treat the most vulnerable of our citizens. It's not the most powerful, but the most vulnerable. And never again will we avert our eyes and say, that's not our problem. It's all of our problem. It's all of our problem. And with these investments, we'll never ever turn away from anyone who needs our help. That is my commitment to you, and that is my commitment to everyone who is going through a tough time in life. People like our friend, Alto Watts, who is joining us here today. He'll talk about what he went through, his experience with the SOS teams, how they made a difference, and I spoke to him about how he can be the voice for so many who didn't know it's available. They thought they're alone. They believe that they're the only ones being affected like this when they have mental health challenges. And yet there are millions across our own state, people who need extra help. And his voice starting here today, but going forward, I believe can help remove the stigma of people in search of help, in search of a healing path to full recovery. So today, Alto has a new lease on life. And ladies and gentlemen, let me bring to the podium our next, next guest, Alto Watts. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Alto Watts. Um, not going to lie, I'm a little nervous, but I'm glad to be able to be here and share how these teams have helped me personally. Uh, when I first connected with SOS and my caseworkers, Erica and Marvin, my mental health was in a terrible place. I had just gotten out the hospital after losing my apartment, had nowhere to go, and was beyond sad and hopeless. Um, they asked me what they could do to help me, and I told them, you can help me get my mental state in a better place and work on getting my housing back. Uh, my caseworkers have helped connect me with mental health professionals and services. They've gone with me to appointments and so much more. Um, while preparing this, I was trying to think of a specific time where they really helped me and I struggled picking just one because ever since I connected with SOS and with my caseworkers, they've helped me so much. I know if I need help, I can reach out to them, and having that support just means everything to me. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to say that I'm now in my apartment, and my mental state is exponentially better than it was when I first connected with them. Uh, this is just the beginning for me. Um, I'd like to just thank SOS. I'd like to thank uh, my caseworkers. I'd like to thank uh, Governor Hoko. Uh, and with that, thanks for listening. I'd like to bring up Erica now. Uh, so, yeah, thank you guys. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so, as Alto said, my name is Erica Riley, and I'm a licensed social worker working with the ACMH Safe Option Support SOS team in Midtown Manhattan as a mental health clinician. I've been working for SOS for over a year and a half and more broadly with individuals experiencing homelessness for four years. Working with the SOS teams is different than some of the other work that I've done. Our teams only have a few clients and that means I get to know those clients like Alto very well. I can build trust with them, which means they'll ask me for what they need and they will tell me if they're struggling. 
trust has allowed clients to say, hey, I really need to shower and rest. Can we talk about that has housing plan the team mentioned? One of the things I love about working with an SOS team is that I get to be in it for the long haul. It's not about helping someone into a home for a night. It's about building a long-term solution that works for them. Long-term solutions mean that we are in the journey with the client when we first meet them during street outreach to the ups and downs of staying in the shelter system and then celebrating them when they secure permanent housing. And because our teams are made up of case managers, peers, nurses, and mental health experts, we can help our clients find housing and find a therapist. We can help our clients find an addiction counselor and job training. Most importantly, working on an SOS team means that I have the time to build trust with the client. I can work on their timeline, which, which might mean clients feel comfortable saying, hey, for right now, I want to just focus on my physical health. My legs are swollen. Can you help me get medical attention? And after a hospital stay, the client feels better prepared to work on housing. Alto is proof that this approach works, and I know it can work for even more New Yorkers in need. I'm grateful for Governor Hochul for continuing to invest in teams like mine, and grateful for the SOS team as a whole. <laughs> Very caring and compassionate group. Okay. Thanks. And that concludes our speaking program. We ask that you please remain seated while we take a quick photo.